Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us in another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan. What's up? Today we have two very special guests. We usually only have one, so this is new for us, but we will be talking about what is a cult and why it's so important to be in the word of God, to know the truth and to share the good news. So it's my honor and privilege to welcome Andrew and Jeremiah from Cultish. Andrew, Jeremiah, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, hey, thanks for having us on. Glad that we can be here. Yeah, yeah super excited. Great. Super excited. Super yes. excited. Yeah. So we're getting used to like figuring out because we're used to only having one person, but now we have two. So mm-hmm. it's going to be fun figuring out who's going to talk first. So mm-hmm. we'll be able to see your guys' personalities too. Yeah. Yep. How you guys well, interact. But you guys well, are here. with Coltish. So can you guys just share, or whoever wants to share, what is that? What is cultish? And maybe just share like who you are and what you do, even with Apologia Church and all of mm-hmm. that fun stuff. Yeah, um, I'll go first, and then Andrew, I'll let you jump in. So uh, right. my name's Je- uh, my name's Jeremiah Roberts, and if you listen to cult cultish, I always say I'm one of the co-hosts here. And so my little story. So uh, currently, I help produce a, a cultish, and Andrew does it alongside with me. Um, I also work for a creative agency that helps with social media and branding content for a filmmaker named Darren Doan, who is also as recently on one of my podcasts on the cult of cancel culture. So Mm -hmm. I I stay pretty busy. I'm also a deacon at Apologia Church. Uh, Just very quickly, the story about how I got into uh, the world, the world of the cults and evangelizing them and really uh, dealing in that whole world was uh, when I was in high school, I ended up going, I was, I grew up homeschooled. I went, ended up going to a high school. Uh, I had to go to a high school because I couldn't be homeschooled anymore because my mom had health issues where she couldn't really school us anymore. They didn't want to send us to a public school. So they decided to, uh, the next best thing was a charter school. Uh, the charter school where uh, right is actually right next to where I live. It just how it happened to be called Heritage Academy, which is a school that just so happened to be 98% Mormon. And so that whole process just began to really challenge me about what do I believe versus what the, what do they what do they believe? And that led me to get a book by someone you may have heard of called James White, who is a very well known apologist. He wrote a book called Letters to a Mormon Elder, which is probably the first book on apologetics I ever read. Uh, I would absolutely recommend. I think it's absolutely recommended reading. The very first chapter called What is Truth has probably set the best foundation for my thinking uh, as a Christian to this day. And I'm honestly surprised more books have not been written it, the way that he constructed that book. It's written, I believe, as 17 fictional letters to a Mormon missionary, and each one is made over a particular topic. So, uh, yes, yeah, maybe one of these days we'll convince him to write a sequel, Letters to Something Else. But that's yeah. the story about it, and then it's very quickly the story about cultish is that Apologia, if you've seen our YouTube channel, we've always, we always have had tons of content about uh, Mormon outreach or just evangelism on the streets, especially at the mm-hmm. Mormon temple. And so it was an amazing process where we could just go out there, do what we were already doing, and then people would, could view the content all around the world. Uh, people would come to Christ, leave Mormonism. Uh, mm-hmm. We'd also come, would cover different cults, and it was just very, very eye-opening for a ton, a ton of people. So, yeah, that was just a very... Uh, interesting process. And so Jeff, uh, uh, Pastor Jeff Durbin approached me uh, around three something years ago and said, hey, mm-hmm. you should start up a ministry that, that's ta- that's uh, fo- laser focused in on the cults, the same way that we have a, a, a ministry called End Abortion Now, which is focused on uh, ending abortion, doing very difficult ministry at abortion mm-hmm. clinics here in Arizona, and also helping equipping other churches about how to do that. So I was thinking about, okay, what does it actually look like? How can we have sort of a platform of what they look like. I came up with the idea, let's do a podcast. And so we spent a couple of months kind of thinking about how we put that together, how we construct conversations. I, I kept on trying to think about what would be a good name for it. And I just had complete writer's block for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And then leading up to when we wanted to launch it, Jeff, Jeff just came up with the idea and said, hey, let's call it cultish. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh my gosh, it's brilliant. Yeah. So... Yeah, that, so that led to uh, jumping on. So initially, Andrew, and I'll let Andrew, you jump into your vantage point, but you were, Andrew was like the super, yeah, he was the super sleuth. So he would mm-hmm. he would just start researching topics about whatever we're going to do a podcast episode on. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, I'd get an email with a 16-page document. 
Wow. I was like, oh my God, it's like, where'd you get this from? <laughs> and so, yeah, so in that process, Andrew was doing background research for our initial episodes. Unfortunately, right when we launched, Jeff unexpectedly had a seizure. Uh, if you've been mm-hmm. following Apologia for a while, if you, that was on our social media, and that was right when Cultish launched. So I was in the process, well, mm-hmm. we just launched this podcast. We got, we got a boost because, you know, we had the backing of, of the studio and, and Jeff. So we, we realized we couldn't really wait around. So I, I told Andrew, like, we've just a podcast. I'm so nervous. I don't, I, I don't even think I know what I'm doing, but we just have to make it happen. And so mm-hmm. we went, I think, to podcast back. That's where the idea of doing a part one and part two came from, I think. And then, yeah, so you just threw that process. Jeff was on a couple more times, but Andrew, you just sort of, you became my uh, trusted sidekick and, ho- and co-host and super sleuth. So that's my vantage point. So tell the, Andrew, I'm going to give it back to you. All right. Yeah. So pretty much, yeah, like Jerry said, I'm, I was like his wingman <laughs> and then I got upgraded a little bit, I guess. But uh, my story goes back to, I was born in Las Vegas, Nevada, and from first grade about to about eighth grade, I was actually going to a Calvary Chapel Christian school when we moved from Las Vegas to Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. And I believe I was a born and grand Christian at a young age. But once we moved over to Phoenix, Arizona, when I was 13, I started going to a secular school. And that's when I uh, came into conflict with, you know, atheists, people that were very new age doing uh, not so good things. And I myself had a very hardcore prodigal son moment throughout my teenage years. I, you know, I backslid hardcore. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older when I started getting relationships uh, with people that were LDS and understanding uh, there's there's this other people out here Mm -hmm. uh, that I got interested in. Well, what do they even believe? Not that I was ever considering uh, being an LDS person. I just knew that there were people, these people called Mormons, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to know more about them. I still claimed Christ, even though I was doing horrible things, right? Like Mm -hmm. drinking and doing drugs and things of that nature. Mm So it was around when I was like 19 or 20 when the Lord really pulled me back to himself and I started going to Grand Canyon Christian, uh, Grand Canyon University out here. And I wanted a major in Christian studies and uh, psychology uh, when the Lord really pulled me back in. So I started doing more studies, especially into the cults. And during uh, after I graduated, I started working at uh, State State Farm. And it was there when I would have free time while I was working, I could listen to videos online and I found some apologetics with LDS people, right? Because I was interested in learning more about them. And I found Jeff's videos out at the Mormon temple and I had been there before. And I was like, that looks just like the temple out there in Mesa. And I found out well it is. And then I found they had a church and I was going at this time to kind of like a seeker sensitive church. I was going to just like a mega church out here in Phoenix. And once I found Apology, a church was an actual church uh, out, out here. I was like talking to my wife. I'm like, all right, babe, this is the real deal. Uh, we feel like we're being called to go here. This is back like in 2016, 2017. So we made the jump and our, we went all in and that's where I met Jerry. And yeah, the Lord just took it from there. I was already doing like background research into the cults. I've always been interested in the cults and our, we kind of like, God just kind of like brought us together. He was one of the mm-hmm. first people that I actually met at uh, Apologia Church, he introduced himself to me as Nostral Domus because that was his nickname <laughs> on Apologia Radio. If anyone's ever listened to Apologia Radio, throwing it way back, and uh, it was it was great. It was uh, it was a good time. And like Jerry said, I was doing the background research for the initial episodes. Then I got thrown on, and you can go back and listen to those episodes. They're called Through Jones Colored Glasses, and you can hear Jerry and I. We're just brand new to this thing. Um, <laughs> just going with the flow, and we've just been doing that ever since, like having a blast. That's our goal. We want to have a blast, but at the same time, while we're having a blast, the main goal of cultish is, like Walter Martin, what he says is, "You're in a cult. I want you out of it mm-hmm. and with Christ." But then it leads us to the definition, even like, "Well, what is a cult, and who are we to have authority on speaking?" to what that even means, which we can go from there. But that's kind of my vantage point with cultish. We want to see people out of the cults and with Christ. We want to see the kingdom of God grow and expand. And that's it. That's what we do, what we do. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I just just want to say one last thing too. And I think that was also really motivating factor for cultish, just because there were a lot of series that had recently had launched um, one was, uh, on A&E, there was a uh, Leah Remini from the King of the Queen. She had a show called Sci- Scientology, the aftermath. And a show like that was, while it was really good content, like very well done. And both my, Leah and Mike, like, I love them both. Uh, if you've seen the show, um, 
but while they did a good job highlighting the, the being, they didn't really approach it from a Christian worldview, which I would argue would say they can't, they couldn't give an ultimate accounting as to mm. why that was wrong to begin with. Like what, by what standard is this actually a real issue? And mm. also just seeing sort of like the vague, you know, you now have a free and open mind. You can now think for yourself, but without the hope of Christ. Um, and there are a lot of people who were really hurt and abused, but without a real point of reference for hope. And that just really broke my heart, just um, that we need to have a catalyst to show people that if you're in a cult, there is hope after you've done that. Because, I mean, the whole process of believing everything you ever thought of was a lie and kind of having that Matrix uh, Morpheus holding up the Duracell battery moment. Like, yeah, I mean, we can also have a chuckle, but for the average person, that cognitive dissonance, and all of a sudden, it's like there's that fragmenting, and all of a sudden, there's that distrust of everyone around you who believes the same thing. And it's it's a very difficult and challenging process. And, you know, another mm-hmm. thing, too, is that a lot of people who are ex-cultists or, or leave a church or they get out of a cult, even ex-cultists who become Christians, a lot of them are not plugged into a local church just mm-hmm. because— there's it's the same thing too if you've been in a bad and abusive relationship you're not in a hurry to jump up jump onto eHarmony like that <laughs> that that's a reality too and so mm-hmm. yeah it's it's a very it's a huge like Walter Martin described it like many even now with covid not everyone has been able to do you know lo- huge overseas travel missions and maybe, maybe that'll pick up you know in the upcoming year now that things somewhat seem to be on some level coming back to normal let's hope so mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, but in many ways, like Walter Martin said, it's the cult next door that is really, it's, the, it's, it's not, not, it's the, the cult of the, really the mission field next door on our doorstep. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's really one of our huge passions uh, to do that, not just behind the studio, but also go out into the world, which you'll be seeing more of too in the near future. So, Amen. Okay. Amen. So like you guys are saying, we, we want to define what a cult is because so many times people We'll just throw that out like the word cancel, like cancel culture, like, oh, you're a cult. And so they've said that about you guys even. They've said people have said that about our church and we can talk about that later. But can one of you guys define what what is a cult? Like what would classify yeah. as a cult? Yeah, let me I'll, I'll jump. In. I'll just say I'll, I'll just give my thoughts real quickly. And then, Andrew, I'll let you you can uh, give your thoughts as well, too. So we normally the, the normal rule of thumb for us is we would go to what Walter Martin's classic definition, and I always paraphrase it because I, I feel like I, I never quote it exactly, mm-hmm. but it's really his diver- his version of a cult is any sort of group, uh, a group uh, or or organization centered around a certain person's or uh, or organization's misinterpretation of the Bible, yeah. where they always will in that process they always use Christian terminology, they'll always pay uh, Jesus lip service, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, because everyone, everyone wants, no one can just discount or get rid of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Everyone, everyone wants Jesus on their team. Mm-hmm. They just have to change him up a little bit. So the cults will always appeal and, and to Christian terminology and to the person of Jesus, but they always categorically use different terms, uh, different terminology, and those sorts of things. That would be my quick definition. Mm-hmm. Andrew, give me give me your vantage point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I when I think about cult and thinking about Walter Martin's definition, I think one aspect to understand about a cult is that their authority does not necessarily stem from the word of God, mm-hmm. right? So when we have a misrepresentation of Christ, it's typically someone who is a central uh, leader in this cult organization that has a standard that they elevate over the Bible in order to interpret the Bible. So we can think of Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, with the Jehovah's Witnesses and Charles Taze Russell. And Judge uh, B. Rutherford, we can think of the Watchtower Track Society, right? These mm-hmm. are standards that are elevated over the Word of God. So we can see a uh, an authority, right, where there's a person who says, well, this is how the Bible should be interpreted mm-hmm. versus in actual Orthodox Christianity, we believe that the Bible is self-authenticating, mm-hmm. right? And that it's the Holy Spirit allows the Bible to speak for itself, mm-hmm. And that God is defined by what the Holy Spirit has written throughout time, not by what men interpret the Bible to be, which leads into misrepresentation. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say in terms of a cult. 
uh, what a cult would be, would be twisting who Jesus is, how you are saved, how you know God. And these are things that are revealed to us through scripture, not that men give authority to. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that's good. And we see that too. A lot of times people who are leading a cult, they're very charismatic, they're very passionate. And so they can get a crowd going and work them up. And the cool thing with the Mm. cool thing, but what the Bible does and with the Holy Spirit is like, you don't have to work anything up. It's just, it's natural and it flows. And so Mm -hmm. that's what we've seen too is like, I think we've seen like different places and things that they feel like they need to work people up to get excited about Jesus instead of just allowing the Holy Spirit to do that. So um, can you guys also maybe just share like some cults, like what you guys said, Mormonism, what are some other things to look at or like well-known cults, I guess? Yeah. Um, so more, so Mormonism is definitely, that would definitely be our bread and butter just because one, my background and it was just interesting. So I initially, I was 15 years old that James White was speaking at this, uh, at this Baptist church on Mormonism. And so that led me to talk to James White and he invited me and my sister to come over, uh, about how to talk to Mormons. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And so then we spent, Mm -hmm you know, the old time, the very first time I was out at the Mormon temple, that's where I met Jeff Durbin. Uh, we just happened to tag team one night. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he was two years older than me. And so we like tag team one night with some Mormons out the street outside the temple here in Mesa, Arizona. And then all of a sudden we, we kind of parted ways and we reconnected four years later. So in many ways, Mormon, is, and we've just grown up around that. So that's been our bread and butter, but um, definitely Je- the Jehovah's Witnesses are probably one of the other well-known cults that we've approached um, a couple of times, and in many ways, Track Society would be one of those mo- moments that, especially with you being a pastor, that it's very important to train Christians um, to be able to understand their Bible. If you if you went mm-hmm. right now in evangelicalism, and you and if we went up to any evangelical church or just say s- students of, of most churches, uh, and you asked them to define the Trinity. Um, mm-hmm. How many? I, I really don't think there's that many of them that could truly define it. I mean, yeah. I, and I'm saying these these are people who be genuinely born again, who are saved, who love Jesus, but they don't have a full scriptural understanding, and more than likely they'll try and explain it in a way metaphorically, where you end up saying something heretical. And that's not to dog on them, but mm-hmm. that's just a byproduct of just not making very important essential Christianity a very important aspect of study. And that's why Walter mm. Martin said a 90-day wonder from the Watchtower uh, can take the average tw- uh, the average Christian and twist them into a doctrinal pretzel. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So I mean, w- Walter Martin definitely had a great sense of humor. Um, you know, a lot of them, a lot of other popular ones would be uh, Scientology, for example. That's more of a popular cult because of the different celebrities that are attached to it. We talked with an ex Scientologist in one of our earlier premiere episodes, which was very interesting. Um, yeah, there's a whole scope and variety of them. Andrew, what are some cults mm-hmm. you're thinking about? Yeah, I was thinking of World Mission Society, Church of God. I was thinking about uh, Jim Jones yeah. and the People's Temple. Um, but I think the main thing to highlight in terms of, well, what is a cult is knowing who Jesus is and what script, who J- scripture says Jesus is, because every mm-hmm. single cult will twist that. Jones, Jim Jones, he twisted Christ to be some form of consciousness, right? So does the New Age. Mm-hmm. Uh, World Mission Society, Church of God has some weird modalistic views of who Jesus is. I mean, we can go back to even the ancient heresies that uh, plagued the early church. They always want to do something else with Jesus. So we know mm-hmm. in terms of who Jesus is in scriptures, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created through him. There was nothing that came into being that was not created through him. And then we have Colossians 1 that says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created on heaven and on earth, mm-hmm. visible or invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things are created through him and for him, and he is before all things. So we have to understand that scripture paints Christ in a light, that he is preeminent, that he is mm-hmm. before all things. Even in Hebrews chapter 1, the supremacy of Christ, we see that he is the eternal God that created all things, that it is his law that was in place. Uh, with the Mosaic covenant between Christ and Moses. Like that's, this is, this is how scripture paints. It's just the story of Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we know what scripture says about Jesus, it's easier for us to figure out who the cults are because they'll always identify themselves by what they do with the central aspect of Christ. Because if you take away the eternality of Christ, Mm -hmm. you no longer have an eternal sacrifice 
for your sins. Therefore, mm-hmm. you're going to have to make it up some way in some legalistic manner. Yeah. And we know that only the eternal God can bear the eternal wrath of God. No, no other figment of someone's imagination can take that place. It's a, it's an idol. And then the people who follow that idol eventually look just like that idol Mm -hmm. uh, itself. So I think that's important. Jerry talks about it all the time uh, in terms of, if you want to know what a counterfeit is, get really good with handling the authentic, right? You want to, you want to hold that hundred dollar bill. You want to know how it feels. You want to go see it. You want to smell it. You can lick it if you want to taste it. So when the other one comes along and you put it in your hands and you're touching it, you're like, this does not feel right so Mm -hmm. yeah know who jesus is yeah and being a be in that relationship with him it it helps a lot that's what i wanted to ask you guys because um you guys you know andrew's a super sleuth right (laughs) you said but uh, (laughs) usually um people are like do i have to study all these cults do i have to know about these you know um and i think it's good to know a little bit about them um but (laughs) The main thing is to know the Word of God, to know Jesus, to spend yeah. time with Him. And uh, you guys are in a different position because you're exposing mm-hmm. different things, so you research a lot more. But, yeah, what do you think, what would you say to just the average you know, Christian? I, I mean, we're not supposed to be average. We're supposed to be on fire, right? Mm-hmm. But what would you say to someone who's not in your guys' position? Like, what, what would you encourage them to study um, or if— would you say not to study? What would you say to them? Watch yeah. cultish. <laughs> what would you, yeah, what, what would you, I'll, I'll let you go first, Andrew, this time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. for sure. Number one, study the word of God. Mm-hmm. Number two, go preach the gospel because what's going to happen is you're going to get in conversations. You're going to realize where you need to study yeah. more. So in terms of knowing who Christ is, you need to study your word, but it's also very good to know what the other side is saying. So you don't get tricked by their definite their definitional switches mm-hmm. right like yeah. mormons they speak christianese so a christian if they're not well acquainted with mormonism mm-hmm. can think they're talking about the same thing yeah. even though they're right, actually I just got that not the other day oh yeah my goodness yeah this guy right th- these mormon boys they really like to do missionary dating let me tell you but i've <laughs> like me and a few of the girls from our church they've been approached on facebook by they call themselves christians and they say hey mm-hmm. We're just a fellow Christian, and we're just seeing how you're doing, and we would like to invite mm-hmm. you to this thing that we're having. And my dad remembers back in the day when they would invite them to dances, and they would go to the bars and like, like kind of do missionary dating to mm-hmm. bring them in and all that. And I was just like, okay, praise God, I do know the truth, and I know like what they're saying is not but how he approached it. And he, then I told him, I said, can you explain to me like why you're a Christian? And he was saying, well, I believe that, you know, Jesus is the son of God. And so that was all he said. And that was enough for him. He's like, the fact mm. that he said that, I'm like, okay, but that doesn't, that you also believe that he's that God, that he's the half brother of Lucifer. You also believe that he's just a good person, that we too, yeah. he was saying later that, well, we too can also be, like Jesus and that. And I'm like, well, how could a sinner die for another sinner then? Like, hence Mm -hmm. why they have to do good works. But anyway, that's what I always tell like girls. I'm like, do not give into it when they say that they're also Christians because they're definitely not. But yeah, you were saying, yeah, yeah. sorry. I, I, th- I think what's really good with that is First Peter 3.15. It says we have to separate separate Christ first as Lord Amen. in our hearts. So we want to be protective, in a sense, over Jesus and who he is and his deity. And when we are, if we're getting in a conversation with somebody, we'll ask questions like, well, what do you mean? You know, like, what do you mean that uh, who, who is Jesus? You say he's the son of God, but what does that exactly. mean? Right. And that's when you can get right. more in deep Mormon theology. It's because why? Well, we care about the deity of Christ. Why? Because he's our savior. Yes. He saved us from eternal damnation, mm-hmm. facing the wrath of God for all eternity. Like Jonathan Edwards states, like when you think the wrath's going to end, it just gets that much worse and worse and worse mm-hmm. because he's a holy God and we deserve the punishment. So we, we're very protective as Christians over who Jesus is because we love him. We're in a relationship mm-hmm. with him. He saved our lives, but go, go from there, Jerry. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, especially when you're talking about, you know, younger women that are being pursued by men who are trying to missionary date them, you know, it's one thing too, where you talk about taking every single thought captive because I'm sure for a young lady, the idea of just being pursued by someone, it's just, that's something that gets you all excited. And uh, one of my friends, Melissa Doherty, uh, you know her. She j- jokingly mm-hmm. says Twitter mm-hmm. paid. She says Twitter paid it. I think that's what she says. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Just get it. Yeah. yeah. So 
Um, so yeah, but in many ways, like you need, you do need to have every thought captive and you need need to think Mm -hmm. level headedly. And so there's an aspect too, where there is a huge terminology difference. There's a language barrier and there's a chapter Mm -hmm. in Walter Martin's book, kingdom of the cults, where it called scaling the language barrier. So when they say that we can become just like Jesus, okay, well, we all agree together as Christians, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's about pursuing hmm. holiness, putting sin to death. Um, you know, just, uh, I'm reading a really good book right now, rereading called, a book called How to Be Free from Bitterness, which is a hmm. lot of like, it's not, that's a very difficult aspect of sanctification. So there's a lot, that's what, hmm. that's what that, yeah. that's what that is. But when it comes, what, 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 what they mean is that Jesus Christ is not the eternal God that's fully God and fully man. He's one God among many gods. Um, mm-hmm. And so, it's, but he's also a created being. And also when it comes to salvation, that salvation is done via eternal marriage and being your husband. And also your husband calling up, a la- calling up your name on the last day. He's get, when, the, when they're married in the Mormon temple, they're given a secret. The, the, the husband is given a secret name by which he is to call up his wife. Mm-hmm. His wife mm-hmm. will never know that except upon the last day. So I make a specific point whenever I talk to, to someone who's female, to a sister missionary, to bring that up. And also yeah. the passages in Matthew where it says, neither are they given, neither are they married in heaven, just paraphrasing it. But yeah, yeah but also really when in John 6, 44, when Jesus says, uh, no one can come, unto, can come unto me unless the Father draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So that they have a very definitive theology. I'll tell you a funny story too. So the high school I went to is 98% Mormon. Wow. Andrew always loves my stories. I was telling some funny stories on our live stream last night. <laughs> and and we could testify to that. But um, I remember uh, in this in this place, Heritage Academy, there was a small little closet that ha- had a piano in it. And you could maybe fit, you could fit a lot of people in there, but it was small. Mm. You could just, it was like a janitor's closet, but somehow they fit a piano in it. And people would go in there to practice the piano. So there's a girl singing. Um, and I was walking down the hallway because I had... Uh, I don't know. I, I might have gotten detention. I don't, I don't recall. I think I'm pretty sure I was innocent. <laughs> but in it, but in it, uh, she's singing. Uh, I know a Mormon boy. He is my pride and joy. One day I'll be his wife. We'll have eternal life. Oh how I love that Mormon boy. You can you uh-huh. yeah. So so you you can look up you can look up the lyrics on YouTube. There's tons of renditions. Or when the, when the Mormons have their scouts. They, the Girl Scouts, like they they sing this song. It's like a it's like a uh, it's like a kids it's like a it's like a, a Sunday school kids camp song in no. Mormonism. So so needs to say when when your friend when anyone in your church is being pursued, like that's that's the end game regardless of the terminology, and that's something they have to be wary of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't you can't be a god or goddess because in Isaiah forty three ten, uh, God says before me there's never no god formed. Neither shall there be after me. There's gods after God, and God says, "Is, is there another God besides me? Yea, there is none. I know not any." So Amen. this it's very so. In summary, it, it, just, it would just be very just to always, always be like I said. Andrew said, "Always be in the Word of God. Always be studying." You know, I no matter how much every single time I study a different group, it's a reminder that I I have ring rust in a certain in certain areas. Um, mm-hmm. I'm talking. Uh, we have a guest coming on soon that came out, that was in the Hebrew Israelites for about ten years, and that was just talking to him was like, oh man, I need to really brush up on my Old Testament. There's a lot mm-hmm. of things that I'm not familiar with, uh, with how they interpret what they believe, with what the Hebrew Israelites believe. So, when when you are approached by um, someone in a cult, um, or you start talking to them. How do you, what is your, I mean, what's your ultimate goal, but how do you approach that conversation or is it different for each person you, you meet or like, yeah. How do you guys go about that when you just meet someone on the street? Yeah. So I think the important thing when you're speaking to somebody who is in a cult is to realize that there are definitional distinctions and we need to scare, scale the language barrier. And the reason why we're scaling the language barrier is so that they can actually hear the gospel free from indoctrination, mm. Mm. right? Like we want to be able to say, well, no, Jesus is this, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. that and preach the gospel through a scaled language barrier. So it breaks down those walls. Right. Mm-hmm. So that that's, that's at least a, uh, 
the uh, approach I like to take. It's always, well, who is Jesus? How are you saved? Mm -hmm. Right. And what standard are you elevating over the word of God? How your prophet fails the test of a prophet in scripture, because I would say 10 times out of 10 in terms of cults, their prophets are failures. And um, bringing to light the fact that they're elevating something over scripture. Therefore, they don't have the correct view of Christ. Therefore, they don't have a savior because it's a fictional Christ and they need a savior. And right now they're dead in their sins and they need to come to a knowledge of saving faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's that's the goal is to get the gospel in there. So learning and trying to scale the language barrier isn't to bury someone in a hole with theology. No, what it is to do is to try to help them hear the gospel free of indoctrination. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's for the person it's with love. And if it's not with love, it shouldn't be done. You're just a noisy gong. Right. Exactly. That's good. Yeah. And I, and I like how you said that too, because so many times, like for me, when I was approached by that guy, I wasn't going to like respond. My friend responded for me because I'm just like, at first I was frustrated because I'm like, who else is he doing this to? And that's why we responded because we're like, this needs to stop. Like, well, obviously Mm -hmm. we can pray, but we need to do our part because I felt bad for him because I'm like, most likely he's also, you know, deceived or whatever. But, but yeah, Mm -hmm. they all know the truth and yet they don't want to submit to it a lot of it is tradition because their family does it they right it's just easy for them and so like you said they need Mm -hmm. to hear the gospel the good news Mm -hmm. and so i love how you put it that way because so many times for us we just a lot of people we just want to learn like all these different things and then if i know this about them or this about their thing because we've said that we've tried that strategy with mormons like well do you know this do you know that you believe this and most of the time they don't even know Hmm. that that's what they believe they kind of just do it just because they do it so i like how you said that simplify it Mm -hmm. tell them the good news how they are a sinner in need of a savior Mm -hmm. they can't do it by their works and so Mm -hmm. um could you guys also maybe share because a lot of people have accused apologia and you guys of being a cult so first of all why do you think that is and what would you say to people who are accusing you i guess of that (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. So, well, I think part of it just has to do with the fact that cult as a whole, it's one of those things, you know, we are in a very emotion-driven culture um, Mm -hmm. where, and this is not to bring up the political, to get super political here, but this is just an awareness, and I'll give you an example of the current event, Um, and I'll just give context to, uh, I'm 39 years old, the very first uh, time I experienced a mass shooting, um, or like observed it happening. I was, thank God I was never part of anything like that, mm-hmm. but it was 19. I was in Washington DC on a trip with the, the high school that's 90% Mormon. And we watched Columbine happen live on TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like all, any of the, if you've ever seen the footage of the kids running out of the, of the classrooms mm-hmm. yeah. or a, out of the school, their hands up. Like I watched that happen live because back mm-hmm. in the day you wouldn't watch it on your phone. Everyone got gather around the TV. I, I, I experienced the same thing collectively with my coworkers uh, in 9-11. Mm-hmm. And so ever since then, you know, it seems like mass shootings have just really become just part of our society. Uh, and so in many ways, you know, we had recently the shooting that happened uh, at the Asian massage parlor. And there was that trending, uh, there was that issue that was trending, stop Asian hate, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, with that, and this is not taking away anything from the victims or anything else. That is, in many ways, I think that was a byproduct of that was sort of the "I can't breathe" yeah. of George Floyd of 2020. And 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 this is the only point in the saying is that both of them are very emotionally uh, driven subjects, and mm-hmm. and both of those things are wrong. That both of those instances that happened was with police officers. George Floyd was evil and wicked, but it's also you have to be aware that the way that people react to it is indicative of the fact that we're living in a postmodern world. Mm-hmm. So slogans aren't necessarily about facts or data or independent lines of testimony. It's not about what something means. It's about how it makes you feel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that's the same way too now with uh, you know the word like like things like privilege or um, like racist, bigot, uh, homophobe, uh, those sorts of terms. So in many ways, cult hasn't really, isn't you typically appealed as far as a historical uh, definition, uh, even under Walter Martin's classic definition, or even by cult experts, it's used sort of as a, as a gaslighting shutdown 
um, phrase just to be disinterested in what you have to say. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so a couple of things too is that we are, are a typical user will have a central authority uh, that is, he's the final authority you go through him. And it's his particular interpretation of the Bible that you're, you have to be fully reliant on. And you also, you can't be saved outside of his group, outside of their group. Uh, Apology is a local church. We are under the authority of elders. There's not one elder, head elder, head pastor that's authoritative over the elders, el- other elders. There's uh, there's other, there's a governing body of biblically qualified elders. There's also other churches in the area that we're accountable to uh, in the same mm-hmm. way. Now, there's been times where we've had people that we say, for example, if you are coming to the Lord's table, and let's just say if someone came from your church that you had to put under church discipline, yeah. uh, we would say that if if, we, if it came about that this person was there was the case, you, know, you 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 could reach out to our elders and say this person is under church discipline. We notice that he's attending your church. Um, and that's something to consider, and we, and we would work with you for a way to restore that person. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, and you'll deal with it in a biblical way. So that's yeah. that's an example of what we would do. We're mm-hmm. we're part of the local body in the local church. Um, our pastors are not the final authority. Uh, the Bible does does give us a, a precedent. It seems that we're going to have elders uh, to to submit to, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it doesn't say that they are the final. They are the final authority. Yeah. So and that's really um, refreshing yeah, that the, you said that because a lot of you know my, when my dad's done that, like if he's seen someone under church discipline and they just kind of run to another church he's uh told the church you know Mm -hmm. warning them like just saying like yeah we're trying to deal with this and now they're going there so i just wanted you to be aware and stuff and and now churches are like why are you telling me that like it's so sad where we've come and but it's so refreshing to hear that Mm -hmm. you guys still do that as well so yeah because it talks about too in matthew 18 and people don't they just see Matthew 18 and they're like, that's just a suggestion. We don't actually have to follow by that. But it's like there are biblical th- ways of dealing with stuff. But I think people just take it in their own hands like, well, this is how I would do it because I, ne- I know how they could respond. So we're not going to do it in this way. But it's like, no, we need to go based off what the Bible says, not mm-hmm. our feelings. So, yeah. yeah. Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. Right? Amen. Sorry. Yeah. Um yeah, so I would just say one last thing. This is a, another important, re- another uh, very important reason why anybody who uh, believes they're called to ministry, uh, typically one of the two things happen if they're if a, a true and just uh, like a true calling to ministry happens. Either they go and they they seek out a local church and elders to say, "Hey, I believe the Lord's calling me to ministry. Um, this is what do you think about this?" But they they find elders to either submit themselves under. Or there's people who are already in the local church who are under the authority of elders, and they get sought out. Um, like I said, and I, I wasn't looking to do cultish. I wasn't looking to do a ministry. I was just happy with where I was at, and I was approached a couple of years ago. And so, mm-hmm. but a lot of times, one of the biggest dangers um, with a lot of churches and groups is that people sort of self-appoint themselves, yeah, exactly. um, rather rather than being raised up from within and being sent out. That's that's a, a dangerous precedent. For a recipe for a lot of uh, a, a lot of narcissism, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of uh, me being the final authority, uh, me not being accountable to anyone. Mm-hmm. So most of the time, if we see someone who's not under the authority of a local church, um, you know that that's something where it's not like a deal breaker in the sense that we wouldn't see them as a Christian, but mm-hmm. it would be something that would be alarming and be concerning because we have seen plenty of times in our ministry. Uh, of being around of people who sort of self-employed themselves. They had a kind of a big ministry, but they weren't under the authority of the local church. Yeah, um, yeah that's that's mm-hmm. an interesting aspect. So, Andrew, what are, what are your thoughts on that? How would you say, for the people yeah. who critique us and say that we are just a cult talking about <laughs> cults? <laughs> right, how do right. How that? Okay, I'd say, number one, the more the culture goes downhill, yeah. right, in a moral downgrade, mm-hmm. the more cultish they're tra- going to try to make this church seem to be right the more mm-hmm. countercultural the church should be why because we believe there is an objective standard of truth that god mm-hmm. has revealed in his word and a christian wants to obey the word of god we want to store the law of god in our hearts so we do not sin against god we're not afraid of sinning against man right we're afraid of sinning against god so if we take a hard stance against abortion and we say it's murder life begins in the womb why because the bible says so mm-hmm. that homosexuality is a sin and their people 
who are practicing homosexuals that need to hear the gospel because we love them, right? We we love them. That's why we want to tell them there's no such Mm -hmm. thing as being transgender. You're born male or female, right? Mm -hmm. We know there's other situations where there's like XX chromosome or XY chromosomes. That's, That's different. It's not what we're talking about. But the more... The world goes into a, a downhill slide. The more they're going to try to point at the church and say, "Oh, you're a cult," like Gary was saying, to try to gaslight, uh, to try to gaslight, to say that everything we say is irrelevant. Well, number one, we have to realize that there's truth and there's false. There's an objective standard, and all other standards are going to fall short. If you mm-hmm. believe that your highly evolved protoplasm that mm-hmm. came from nothing, that you have no meaning or purpose in life then you really have nothing to back up any of your claims. Therefore, now words have no meaning. Yeah. Uh, gender has no meaning. All of these things are purposeless, yet they try to live a purposeful life without God and they become absurdities. Mm-hmm. So in terms of a church being called cultish, the first things that need to be asked, well, who is Jesus? How are you, how are you saved? Mm-hmm. Right? And how do they treat their members and who is their authority? Like Jerry mm-hmm. was saying, our, our elders... Even on sermons, they'll say, don't, don't look at me, check scripture, yeah. check scripture. Scripture is the standard. Mm-hmm. And in terms of apology at church, yes, we have doctrinal distinctions that we differ from other members. We're not Pentecostal, yet mm-hmm. we don't demonize Pentecostals, right? They're still our brothers and sisters mm-hmm. in Christ. Why? Because we all agree on the core mm-hmm. principles of truth, right? We're yeah. all members. We're, uh, like it says in Colossians, we're held together like the joints and ligaments, right? Yeah. We grow with the growth that is from God. We're indeed mm-hmm. we're indeed called in one body and to mm-hmm. be thankful, although we have different functions and purposes. So, yeah, I mean that that that's what I would say. Our standards, the Bible. Um, our elders are not celebrities. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are standing in line by the word of God to be corrected by the word of God, yeah. loving the people that are in the congregation, want to see them grow in sanctification, take it very seriously that you have to give an account as an elder for the the, the sheep that God has given you to take care of mm-hmm. until he takes them or calls them home, right? These are things that should be taken seriously. And I think mm-hmm. anyone who takes them very seriously, any church that takes it very seriously could by culture be called a cult mm-hmm. and could by lukewarm churches be called a cult as well yeah. unfor- unfortunately that's just the world we live in today yeah yeah like i was saying before we started um it's, it's sad because i see people um coming to the lord and you know friends i've had in high school and we went to a christian school but then they realized they weren't really taking their faith seriously it was more their parents faith mm-hmm. and stuff and so they're coming and then they're like wow like if i truly want to change my life a lot of my friends and family and stuff are going to think i'm in a cult because there's there's a change change. a radical change and that's so sad how that radical change for good and for the glory of god is now called cultish and you know i think it's because the american church or you know the The american church yeah Yeah progressive it's uh it's not much different than the world yeah. like you're yeah you go to church but your life isn't truly changed and uh so that's what we encourage is to we we just want to hold each other accountable to the word of god and i think that's the difference in cults they seem like they're trying to hide things from mm-hmm. people there is there's a special knowledge or it's only for a select few yeah, or elders. yeah and so yeah that's we're open to people asking questions we're open to people saying well the word of god says this so how do you say that you know mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. yeah. we're open for discussion because we're not perfect yeah. and yeah and so we want to look at the word of god and make yeah. sure that we're following it and so if someone says the word of god says this why aren't you doing that yeah. we're we're able to humble ourselves hopefully by the grace of god mm and submit to the word of God. So, Amen. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that and that's and that's just something real quickly I think you need to be always be wary of, especially mm-hmm. if someone is saying that like, "Hey, I'm seeing something in the Bible that no one else has ever seen before." Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that's that, <laughs> yeah. that, that that's uh, that's always a uh, Yeah. Maybe you have a younger audience, so maybe they, they're into Among Us, so the new word is sus. That that would be that would be that would be kind of sus if I'm gonna be yeah. the, if I'm if I'm gonna put my hip youth yeah. pastor trying to relate to the youth put your skin yeah. so. on. <laughs> I just learned about that. I'm not a gamer or anything. Kevin showed me, uh, but yeah, yeah, like I said that on Sunday is um, a lot of times 
um, what was that thing you said? Ah, I forgot. Sorry, but yeah, a lot of times we we try if we have new knowledge yeah, and we're being knowledge. like the Gnostics, right? And right. I think a lot of that you see you see a bunch of cults popping up, and you're like, how do how do new things form? It's because there's new twistings of scripture, and it's <laughs> based on feeling and mm-hmm. what I want. But like my friend, I was talking to him. He's like, you can tell that the the, the word of God wasn't uh, written just by man. Yeah, we know it's written by man, but it's inspired by God. Amen. Because the things that it says, the things that it tells us to do, is usually everything opposite yeah. of what our flesh wants. You yep. know, so you know it's not a man-made religion. It's God, mm-hmm. and he he says these things because he loves us and mm-hmm. he wants the best for us. So yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, oh, I also wanted to ask. Sorry. I wanted to ask about um, those who have been abused by yeah. cults and different yeah. things, or even by uh, churches who, yeah. you know, that you know they maybe they missed it on something, and so they got disillusioned. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say to them? Because I know a lot of people are just trying to do home churches and just kind of pulling yeah. away, and there's yeah. so much division in that. So, yeah. what would how would you encourage people like that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'll say something real quick, a couple of things and I'll let you jump in, Andrew, is that mm-hmm. one, I think one of the things that we had an episode that we did with uh, Jeff after he got over his seizure called Leah Remney and the Jehovah's Witnesses, where we, we actually covered a special they did on people who are in the Watchtower and they were different, dealing with different aspects of disfellowshipping, for example, mm-hmm. where they get disfellowshipped and they get disconnected and they, you know, they, where and their relatives, they're instructed not even to look into their own eyes, you know, and they, one of the guys talked about in the show and it was like, it was heavy too, where you said that and he goes, you know, if someone commits like a heinous crime, right. The fa- usually you'll have one or two family members there as they'll, as they're passing sentence. When the jury passes sentence at a trial, they're, they don't condone the crime, but they are there as the representative of them. And he said, and he, then he, he went on to say, like, what crime have we committed? Our family members can't even look into our eyes or acknowledge our existence. Mm-hmm. So in many ways, like, there's there's a there's a challenge for someone who, we had a guy, Clay, who's been on our show before. He is a former, he was, a, he was in the Watchtower for 30-something years. And he struggled coming out of the Watchtower. He was an alcoholic just because a lot of, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses are closet alcoholics because, they have to put on a perfect face. They have to act like everything's fine when it's really not. Yeah. They're taught to mm-hmm. they're taught to stuff all their emotions inside and not deal and not process anything. Mm-hmm. Anything, and so yeah, I mean, when he came, there was a lot of challenges. Like he he was a new Christian and he was part of Apologia and he loved Jesus and knew and and knew and felt the joy of the Lord. But there were challenges. Like there was a couple times we had to practice biblical church discipline, yeah. and. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's an, of course, you know, there'd be a, oh no, like, are they, are they just felching someone? Like there's an association with that, but it's not biblical church discipline. It's not there to bring harm to someone. Mm -hmm. It's there. It's, it's tough love. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. yeah. The goal is to restore them. It says, treat them like an unbeliever. As Christians, how are we supposed to treat unbelievers? We're supposed to be all the gospel. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing. And so I think a lot of times there, there is a lot of, you know, baggage and trauma or what have you, um, that you mm-hmm. need to take into account. Um, there is, however, a level of responsibility you still have as a Christian. If you are in Christ, you still still have to be obedient. Just mm-hmm. because you experience, just because you experience a trauma in your life, doesn't give you a, a precedent to be disobedient. So that I would say that, yeah, there is a level where we, we want to have compassion, work through that, but at yeah. the same time is someone's going to willfully say no i'm not going to do go to the church well you're being disobedient because the bible says you are do not forsake Amen. the fellowship mm-hmm. you know do not do those sorts of things and so yeah it's it's definitely yes yeah, so one of the thing in the jehovah's witnesses episode uh one of the jeff said he said if you he's talking you know some of the abuse of the experience and he said if you went through this trauma like you need to realize like that wasn't God to begin with. Yeah. And we actually had people that messaged us personally who got discon disfellowship and disconnected from different cults and said like when Jeff said that, that was like 
sorry, I'm getting a little emotional here, but it was like it was like life like giving back to them. Yeah. So yeah, and that's 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 kind of like what what drives me. Mm-hmm. Like when it when it comes to cultists is people who have had everything taken from them. Yeah. yeah. And giving and giving that and giving like that real hope, the real hope mm-hmm. that that <laughs> Christ give. I wear my heart on my shoulders, so yes. just so you know too. No. So but, but yeah, this is that that that's like the real like reality of the gospel. And so mm-hmm. I think, you know, there there is a level of like compassion and like understanding that there is a lot of emotional baggage that you have to be aware. Of. There's like a language barrier too, even with talking with an ex cultist. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you could be talking about Christian life or Christian this or just you know, like, hey, what's going on? I haven't seen you in church for a while. You know, if they're like struggling, yeah. that could be like they could, that reaching out to them that could put their defenses mm-hmm. up. So there's a really good book called Out of the Cults and Into the Church. It's by Janice Hutchinson, I think her name is. Uh, it was I picked it up in Sandra Tanner's bookstore. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's a really good book. So those are a couple of my those are a couple of my thoughts. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that. that's awesome. That's good, brother. Like the the first thing I was thinking as well was what Jeff said, that's the first thing that popped in my mind is, is not God to begin with. Right. So in terms of getting somebody back into the church, who's professing a faith in the true and living God, we have to be aware that there has been spiritual and a lot of times physical abuse that has happened to this Mm -hmm. person. But I think what the Bible does perfectly is gives us uh, a scripture that I think is so comforting. It's this, it says it's uh, second Corinthians, uh, Chapter one, three through five, it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those Mm -hmm. who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. So realizing Mm -hmm. the fact that if we have somebody who is coming to Christ, we have someone who is a, a member of Christ's body, mm-hmm. right? Let's say they're like a finger to Christ's body. It, the, the finger can't get its blood, its supply when the finger's severed from the body, mm-hmm. right? It, it needs to be with the fellowship of believers. Yeah. It needs to feel that blood supply. And there's a there's also a level of responsibility with us as Christians inside the church to come alongside these people yeah. and help them heal, right? Mm-hmm. And then the elders, of course, to do their counseling, to get them to know that it's okay to to, you know, that you've experienced these things, but we know that God works all things together for good for those who love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not a purposeless suffering. It's one that's meant to conform you into the image of Christ. You are a block that is being put in into the, like shaped by Christ into his temple, a holy temple. And sometimes it hurts, man, when you're being chiseled away Mm -hmm. at, but guess what? You're not being thrown aside. No, by no means you're being placed Mm -hmm. with the rest of believers in this holy nation, Mm -hmm. this temple built by God himself. So there's no um, purposelessness in the suffering. Let's, let's, let's share your suffering together. Let's point you to Christ. There's healing, there's hope, and there's true love that you can find by looking solely at Jesus Christ, the one who will never fail you, you know? So that's, that's, that's one thing that's on my heart. Yeah. And even if it's not a cult, even if a church has wronged you or, uh, someone you yeah, look up to, yeah. like a pastor, falls. Like a Robbie. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that Christ isn't real. It's just they are the ones you failed. It's that person, yeah. and yeah. that's why we're not supposed to, like the Bible says, Jesus didn't entrust his hearts to men. You know, yeah, we can hopefully fellowship and love one another, but it's not about each other. It's about God first, Amen. and then yeah. He gives us Amen. the love for each other, right? So, I like that and how. I, that's what I was telling my friend who is coming and just um, really devoting his heart to God. I was saying, you know, if even if this church um, just went crazy for some reason, I pray that that doesn't happen by the grace of God. But even if that happened, you're still responsible to love God. You're mm-hmm. still responsible to look at his word and obey and follow. It's not about us or anything like that. And I think that's the difference, too, is that. You know, we're supposed to serve God no matter what. It's not a singular church. It's not Apologia Church. They're the only right church. Or Calvary or Valley. Mm-hmm. We're the only right church. No, no. it's God. <laughs> and that's, he loves his church. Yeah. And and there's a lot of churches that have compromised and a lot yeah. of churches that um, aren't. It's hard to say that they're truly doing the will of God. Mm-hmm. 
but there's still believers in there. There's still sincere people at yeah. times. So, and and God, you know, God's gonna separate the wheat from the chaff, and so mm -hmm. we can just Amen. pursue Him and fix our eyes on Him, kind of like that that old hymn, right? Yeah. Like just even though no one follows, you still do, right? So, go with me. Yeah. and well, it's yeah. just cool too, just seeing what you guys do at Apologia and with Cultish because. You definitely see that you have a lot of different things you do, but the main message is the gospel, the good news. And even when it comes to like abortion, how important that is, because nowadays, even you guys are talking about even pro-life people, they are trying to go based off like feelings and feeling bad for the person or the mother, which yes, right, we have compassion we love them but that doesn't mean that we're going to shy away from the truth of the good news that there is hope that they can change but mm. first we all need to know that we are all sinners right and mm. so i i just love that it's like no matter what anyone has gone through whether they are like they've been victimized or what that there is victory with mm. you know the cross of jesus and what there's he's hope. done so i oh, what okay. i just said there's hope Oh, yeah. I thought you said, oh, I'm like, oops. No. But yeah, so we're <laughs> thankful for you guys. We know that we're past the time, but do you guys have any mm -hmm. last thoughts or any closing thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I'll just say like one last thing too. It's, I think this is, we're at a very interesting time. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we've the world, we've always been through strange times. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been through, you know, a couple, quite a few different Reagan, you know, uh, different uh, presidencies, uh, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in every single year, it's like, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the end of the day, like we're Christians, we're part, we we're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Mm -hmm. But I think we are in a process that in many ways that God is separating sort of the wheat from the tares mm -hmm. right now at this particular point in church history. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, so I think in many ways, like a lot of churches, it, many churches deal with, are dealing with, they, they've been kind of seeing things, dealing with their church as a corporation yeah. versus an actual body of believers. And so mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons why the Enneagram has just mm -hmm. blown up like wild, why a wildfire because it's hip yeah. and mm -hmm. it's trendy and there's an aspect of commercialism to make it look cool without having the word of God as our standard. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think, I think there's just a huge, there's a huge challenge ahead for the church, um, especially on different spheres. Also when it comes to, you know, and ultimately Every church is going to make their decision, for example, how to deal with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times there is like the, the Bible does state there are two. There's a big distinction between civil government and church government. Uh, mm -hmm. Pastor James Coates, who was arrested uh, up mm -hmm. in Canada, he specifically uh, disobeyed the government because he said that the government, they are unjustly overreaching and saying they are trying to be the head yeah. of the church but rather than him and let people self-governing themselves so mm -hmm. um, i think a lot of churches are going to have to there is a temptation where if you're dealing with it just as a corporation where any corporation i used to work for costco they want to be government compliant so they need to do whatever they can to, to make the the most amount of, amount of profits up uh, uh most amount of of, of profit yeah. so but if you are if you have a church if you're a church and your goal is you know, money, 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 money. Um, well, that's your, it's going to be that allure to be submissive to the government. It, that's a, that's a nice carrot. So mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit of a tangent, but I think in many ways that the whole cultist world is big. Yeah. I mean, uh, the world's beginning a, is becoming a whole lot more cultish. Yeah. And so the more cultish it gets, the more grounded you need to get mm -hmm. and really have Christ more valuable than anything else. I would say for anyone who's a Christian too, the best book I have read um, just about practical Christian living, how to live as a Christian first um, in the world that we're living in, just take into account previous history of how other Christians have gone under persecution, um, how to live in a way. It's a book called Live Not By Lies. Mm -hmm. And it's called a manual for Christian dissonance. It's on my, I shared it on my Facebook page. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, look up that book, get it on Amazon, get it on audible, get it from your local bookstore. It's probably one of the best books you can read as a Christian to it. Again, I'm a very busy guy. I barely have time for audio books, but it's worth a mm -hmm. second listen in my opinion. So I would say, check out that Andrew, enough of me. What do you got to say to wrap up? No, oh, no, bro. You, you got it, brother. Like, I just say thank you for having us on. Uh, yeah. It was a definite blessing. And, 
yeah, Christ is king, mm-hmm. and he's the only God that can keep the state at bay. If if uh, if you're following something else, you'll eventually become like the thing you're worshiping, mm-hmm. and you may be compliant to the state in ways you shouldn't be, because only Christ and his kingship and his federal headship as the king of kings and lord of lords is the only one. Amen. Mm-hmm. That can stop the evil of the state Amen. <laughs> and put it and put it in its place. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And can you really quickly share where the, our listeners can find your resources um, in Cultish? Um, yeah, they can go to uh, cult, the cultishshow.com and that's our website. Uh, there you can kind of tag around there. We have a, we have different podcast episodes. There's you know, the place where people can give to our minister if they want to do that. Uh, we got a connection to our merch shop. We definitely have cool cultish merch. Mm-hmm. And we'll have more cool stuff coming out this year, which is which is always a fun thing. Um, you can also go to apologiastudios.com. Uh, there is a, you can support the studio um, that we are operating out of. And that's called All Access. We do an after show off of that. So if, they, if people love the show and they want to go deeper, uh, there's also the ability to do that as well. Okay. So that, that that's where people can find this. Yes, well, we're going to encourage everyone. It'll all be in the description below, and so they can go check that out. And we are blessed to have you guys. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless. Amen.